Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. We are here at the end of July. What is time? And I am here to do a book haul. I have a massive pile of books here to talk to you about. I've been trying to do smaller book hauls this year. Or originally that was kind of the thinking behind it. But what I am coming around to is that I really just want to be more intentional with my book hauls. Because this is my third year on BookTube, I believe. And in the past, you know, you get really excited about things. You end up buying a lot. So I want to be more intentional with the things that I bring into my library since I have limited amount of space. And I've been trying to use my book haul revisits to help me do that. So this is a really large book haul. But looking at the titles on it, I think I've done a good job picking books that I am going to want to read and really interested in. There are some books on here that are more like library builders that I don't have intentions to get to like immediately. There are a lot of books in here that are part of my Pulitzer Prize project. So I will be getting to them at some point. And because a book is part of my Pulitzer Prize project, I'm inclined to want a copy on my shelves. So five of these books, and I don't know what the total number here, let's find out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. I have 13 books here. Five of them are from my Pulitzer Prize project. I'm really interested in a lot of them. I think you will be too. So let's kind of dive in since we're going to have a lot to talk about. The first one that I got is The Netanyahu's, an account of a minor and ultimately even negligible episode in the history of a very famous family by Joshua Cohen. This is the book that won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction this year. I had not read it. I had barely heard of it when it won the Pulitzer. I'll put my reaction down below. I was very surprised. I did include it in my Pulitzer Prize predictions video as something that maybe would have an outside chance because there's always the chance that the Pulitzer jury is going to recommend a book that nobody has really heard of. Think of Tinkers by Paul Harding. And it's really difficult to try to anticipate what unlikely book that nobody is talking about is going to win because for something to have buzz people need to be talking about it kind of inherently and I saw this on somebody else's prediction and I looked into it and it seemed like an interesting contender but that's the only reason I had put it in my predictions video I didn't think it really had a chance and here it is as the winner now since it won the Pulitzer I ordered it immediately the same day that the Pulitzer Prize was announced before I even filmed my reaction video, I called Montana Book Company to get an order in. I think because it was a relatively unknown book, there probably weren't very many copies of it available, and they probably all got snapped up virtually immediately. So it took a really long time for it to come in. I imagine they had to reprint a bunch of copies of this book to meet demand. It is published by New York Review of Books, by the way. So it took a long time to get here. I just got it maybe a week or two ago, and here it is at last. Since it won the Pulitzer, I know several people who have read it, and they all say pretty much the same thing. It's a good book, or it's fine, like some variation on that. N nobody I know who has read this has loved it, or said, oh my god, you have to read it. They basically just said, it's a good book. I'm glad I read it. And then that's kind of it. So I don't have any sense of urgency to get to this. I might not even get to it this year at this point. If people had been more excited about it, I probably would try to prioritize it. But I have lots of other books to get to from a Pulitzer Prize project. So what I'm thinking is, if I don't get to it this year, which is very likely, I might try to read it next year as part of the build-up to next year's Pulitzer Prize for fiction. That seems like a good plan to me. I, I don't feel like a, a rush to get to this, but I will. If you're wondering what it's about, I'm going to steal a blurb from the publisher's website about this because it's really short and succinct. Corbin College, not quite upstate New York, winter 1959 to 1960. Reuben Bloom, a Jewish historian, but not an historian of the Jews, is co-opted into a hiring committee to review the application of an exiled Israeli scholar specializing in the Spanish Inquisition. When Benzion Netanyahu shows up for an interview, family unexpectedly in tow, Bloom plays the reluctant host to guests who proceed to lay waste to his American complacencies. 
Mixing fiction with nonfiction, the campus novel with the lecture, The Netanyahu's is a wildly inventive, genre-bending comedy of blending, identity, and politics that finds Joshua Cohen at the height of his powers. It does sound really interesting. Again, if people had been more excited about this book after they read it, I probably would have more of a sense of urgency to get to it, but I haven't seen anybody be really just wowed by this book. Therefore, I'll get to it at some point. In my book hauls, I like to read a little bit of the opening of each book. So I'm going to do that right now. Chapter one. My name is Reuben Bloom, and I'm an, yes, an historian. Soon enough, though, I guess I'll be historical, by which I mean I'll die and become history myself in a rare type of transformation traditionally reserved for the purer scholars. Lawyers die and don't become the law. Doctors die and don't turn into medicine. But biology and chemistry professors pass away and decompose into biology and chemistry. They mineralize into geology. They disperse into their science just as surely as mathematicians become statistics. The same process holds true for us historians. In my experience, we're the only ones in the humanities for whom this holds true. The only ones who become what we study. We age, we yellow, we go wrinkled and brittle along with our materials until our lives subside into the past to become the very substance of time. That is the opening of the Netanyahu's, an account of a minor and ultimately even negligible episode in the history of a very famous family by Joshua Cohen, this year's Pulitzer Prize winner. I will get to it at some point. If you've read it, I'd love to hear what you thought of it in the comment section down below. The next one is another Pulitzer Prize book. I found a used copy of it, The Collected Stories of Catherine Ann Porter. This was a Pulitzer Prize winner from the 1960s, I believe. And I'm going to rely on the blurb on the back for this one because I think it pretty succinctly summarizes her career. She is a really interesting case because she was a popular writer at the time she won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. But people don't really talk about her all that much anymore. And it feels like people only discover her now because of her Pulitzer Prize win. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy about this Pulitzer Prize project. It brings to light things that might have been otherwise forgotten. And by all rights, she is a great writer. This does feel like one of those cheat scenarios because there have been a couple of instances where someone won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction by collecting a bunch of their previously published works together. And that doesn't quite seem fair, but technically it is eligible. I don't know that it would happen today, but it did happen in the past. The Stories of John Cheever is another example. Gene Stafford, same thing. So let's do the blurb from the back. Despite the enormous success, both critical and popular, of her novel Ship of Fools, which was also turned into a movie that was nominated for a bunch of Oscars, Catherine Ann Porter's reputation as one of America's most distinguished writers rests chiefly on her superb short stories. This volume brings together the collections Flowering Judas, Pale Horse, Pale Rider, and The Leaning Tower, as well as four stories not available elsewhere in book form. Edmund Wilson has said of this master stylist, Miss Porter writes English of a purity and precision almost unique in contemporary fiction. So you can see they pulled together stories from three different books that had already been published. They did add four that had not been previously published. Feels like a bit of a cheat. Is eligible. I'm not going to knock it. Short stories used to have a much bigger chance at winning the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. It's been a while. It's been about a decade since the story collection won. The Visit from the Goon Squad was the last one, and that's interconnected stories. So I'm, I'm going to be interested to see some of the ones that have won. I've read Interpretive Maladies, Visit from the Goon Squad, Olive Kitteridge. It'll be interesting to get back to some of the older collections. So let's just do... The very first line of the very first story, which is called Maria Concepcion. Maria Concepcion walked carefully, keeping to the middle of the white dusty road where the maggy thorns and the treacherous curved spines of organ cactus had not gathered so profusely. She would have enjoyed resting for a moment in the dark shade by the roadside, but she had no time to waste drawing cactus needles from her feet. Juan and his chief would be waiting for their food in the damp trenches of the buried city. That is The Collected Stories of Catherine Ann Porter. This edition is published by Harcourt. I really look forward to getting to that as part of my Pulitzer Prize project. I don't know when I will get to it, but I will <laughs> at some point. Let's stick with the Pulitzer Prize theme. I got three Franklin Library editions. If you follow along, you know I have become sort of obsessed with these Franklin Library editions of Pulitzer Prize books. 
they don't make any or didn't make any for books that won the Pulitzer past 1980. There are some from the 1980s where they did special editions, but those are ridiculously expensive online because they are special editions, but they're also signed first editions of the Franklin Library edition. So it just amps up the cost a lot. So the first one that I got is The Store by T.S. Stribling. This is one of the most forgotten Pulitzer Prize books. Nobody talks about this. Because it is so relatively obscure in this day and age, copies of it tend to be extremely expensive online because they're all used. There were not a whole lot of later printings of this book as there were with others. Like usually when you look for a used book online, you can find an edition that was published in the 60s or 70s or 80s. That is not the case with this one. You have to get something from early on in its publication run, and copies can be very expensive. So periodically, roughly once a month, I will check to see if there are used copies of books that I need for my Pulitzer Prize project that are affordable, preferably in the Franklin Library edition. And I scored big last month. The store was the biggest get because, like I said, copies of this are usually very expensive. But I got two others that were also cheap. So I got this for like $25. That is by far the best price of this that I had seen in a while. It is the second part of a trilogy. And my rule of thumb for my Pulitzer Prize project is that if a book is part of a series, I would try to read the books that were published before it. I don't feel obligated to read anything that was published after because those were published after the Pulitzer Prize happened, didn't have an impact on whether or not it won the Pulitzer, why it won the Pulitzer, or the arc of its journey to becoming a Pulitzer Prize winner. So for instance, this book has a predecessor, I would like to read it, but Lonesome Dove didn't have any sequels or prequels at the time it was written, so I don't feel obligated to read any of them. There are books that take place before Lonesome Dove, but they were published later, which means I don't feel obligated to read them. And I kind of like Lonesome Dove being what it is, so I'm not going to do any of those. The problem is that, as is the case with this book, it's difficult to find copies of the first book in the series that are affordable. I think the cheapest one I could see was like $40. So I'm going to have to figure that out. I'm not in any rush to get to this. So I have plenty of time, but there is a book that I would like to read before I can get to this one. In terms of what it's about, I'm going to rely on the description that is online because they don't really have good editions. But part of what I love about the Franklin Library, each one has a different design in the gold emboss on the cover. They have these sort of leather binding, different design in there. They all have different illustrators. They open with these two page spreads. And then they, by the way, this won the Pulitzer Prize in 1933. Let me see if I can find another illustration. This one has very interesting, different illustrations. A little more stylized than some of the other ones. Beautiful, beautiful editions of these books. So, winner of a Pulitzer Prize in 1933, the store is the second novel of Stribling's monumental trilogy set in the author's native Tennessee Valley region of North Alabama. The novel's action begins in 1884, when Grover Cleveland becomes the first Democratic president since the end of the Civil War. At that time, Democratic and Republican parties were very different from what they are now. Just let me add that little footnote. And it centers about the emergence of Colonel Miltiadis Viden as a figure of wealth and power in the city of Florence. Viden is the character that the trilogy follows. It's called the Viden Trilogy. In this store, Stribling succeeds in presenting the essence of an age through the everyday lives of his characters. Writing in The New Statesman and Nation upon publication of this book, Gerald Bullitt stated that the store is a first-rate book of its kind, a good story filled with diverse and vital characters, and much of it cannot be read without that primitive excitement, that eagerness to know what comes next, which is, after all, the triumph of a good storyteller. And because it is one of the more forgotten Pulitzer Prize winners, I am looking forward to it, but I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do with the first book in the series, because by my own rule of thumb, I kinda need to read it. Here's the opening of the store. 
In response to his wife's uncertain inquiry about the political speaking, Colonel Miltiades Biden called back from his gate that he did not think there would be any ladies at the courthouse that evening. By laying stress on the word think, the colonel not only forecast a purely masculine attendance in Courthouse Square that summer evening in Florence, Alabama, but at the same time he subtly expressed his own personal disapproval of women appearing at political gatherings at any place or time whatsoever. I mean, how dare they? That is The Store by T.S. Stribling. It'll be a very interesting book to get to as part of my Pulitzer Prize project, but I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do with The Forge, which is the first book in the series. Next is another Franklin Library edition. It's really beautiful in person. It doesn't photograph very well because it's a very light color. The gold emboss on this one, I don't know if you can see it, it's little trees. It's very pretty in person. It's very difficult to convey how pretty it is in a photo or a video, so go with me on that. Honey and the Horn by H.L. Davis. Again, this is a Franklin Library edition. This was another early Pulitzer Prize winner, another one that is largely forgotten. It won in 1936, so three years after The Store by T.S. Stribling. I don't know why I'm going to the <laughs> first sentence of the book. There are not a whole lot of descriptions about this. By the way, Honey in the Horn appears to be a line from a squ sort of square dance song. That's where that comes from. Here's the description of the book on Wikipedia. It's really, really short. Honey and the Horn is a novel about the life of, in the homesteading days in Oregon, 1906 through 1908. It is about the coming of age of an orphan boy named Clay Calvert, but it is also about the trials of the pioneers who came to Oregon following the American dream. Through the characters that Clay meets along the way, the author introduces the readers to the various occupations of the settlers of that area. And you can see why I wanted to do a video defining what the American Dream might mean before I did my Pulitzer Prize deep dive on Beloved. I'll put a link to my American Dream, or what is the great American novel uh, video down below, because in that conversation, a lot of it deals with the American Dream, and this is a book that goes in that direction. So now, now that we've done everything else, here is the two-page spread that the book opens with. Really beautiful illustrations. These are much more traditional. I'll find another one after I do the opening line. Chapter one. There was a rundown old toll bridge station in the Shoestring Valley of Southern Oregon where Uncle Preston Shively had lived for 50 years, outlasting a wife, two sons, several plagues of grasshoppers, wheat rust, and caterpillars, a couple or three invasions of land-hunting settlers and real estate speculators, and everybody else except the scattering of old pioneers who had cockleburred themselves into the country at about the same time he did. That is Honey in the Horn by H.L. Davis. Let me find another illustration. Really beautiful illustrations in this book as well. That's one of the reasons I love the Franklin Library editions of Pulitzer Books. And another forgotten Pulitzer book, Journey in the Dark by Martin Flavin. This is much more apparently beautiful in photos and videos because you can see that stunning design on the cover. And I'm going to rely on the online description for this one as well. In a sensitive and full-dimensioned portrayal of American life, Martin Flavin has created a memorable character. By turns admirable, pitiable, tough, noble, weak, futile, and brilliantly effective, a lonely man going nowhere in the dark, Sam Braden mirrors thousands like him who have put their familiar stamp upon the American way of life. As an aside, remember the Pulitzer Prize is supposed to go to an American author, preferably for a book that deals with American life. So there you go. He wanted wealth and he got it. He wanted to belong to the social world in which the Wyatts moved so easily. And in time, he did. Most of all, he wanted Eileen Wyatt. And this, too, he achieved, but only after a fashion. To explain this average man who had wanted success above everything and who achieved an enviable degree of it, and yet who never escaped from the prison of his loneliness, Martin Flavin takes the reader back to the friendly democratic world that existed along the Mississippi in the 80s, to the influences which shaped the boy and fixed the pattern of a man. And when they say Mississippi in the 80s, I'm guessing they mean the 1880s not the 1980s, as you can probably imagine, because this won the Pulitzer Prize in the year 1944. So, yeah, 1880s. Here is the opening illustration. Very pretty. The ones in this book are in the same shades of black and red, which are quite striking. Here we go. Chapter 1. Sam Braden never talked about his father. If he spoke of his family, it was always of his mother, and always with affection and respect. 
A portrait of her hung in the library at Glencoe, across the room from a portrait of his wife. It had been made long years after her death from a daguerreotype taken when she was a bride, and it showed a very lovely face, thoughtful and gentle, with soft dark hair and sober, questioning eyes. The painter had idealized his subject, and yet had captured something from the cracked and faded glass, a sense of quality and honesty. When visitors looked at it, my mother, Sam would say, she was a Hathaway, old colonial stock, and this was true. If they asked about his father, my father was a lawyer, Sam would answer, and then would change the subject. And this was only partly true. Not true at all, in fact. Interesting opening to the book. Let me find one more illustration to show you. And now we can move on to the next book. That covers the Pulitzer Prize project portion of this video. We're done with that from now. But the next book is a Pulitzer Prize winner, just not for this. I saw Kim at middle of the book march talking about the New York stories of Edith Wharton last month and immediately had to order a copy for myself. Here it is. I will put a link to Kim's video down below. Edith Wharton was one of the very first winners of the Pulitzer Prize for Age of Innocence, and I read that book a couple of years ago, loved it. I am hoping to reread it as part of my Pulitzer Prize project. But this just sounded really interesting. It's Edith Wharton writing about New York, as only a native can, according to the back of this book. Her Manhattan is a city of well-appointed drawing rooms, handsomes and brahms, all-night cotillions and resplendent Fifth Avenue flats. Bishop's nieces mingle with bachelor industrialists. Respectable wives turn into excellent mistresses. All are governed by a code of behavior as rigid as it is precarious. What fascinates Wharton are the points of weakness in the structure of old New York. The artists and writers at its fringes, the free love advocates testing its limits, widows and divorcees struggling to hold their own. Really excited. I don't have, this is a library builder. I don't have any plans to get to it immediately or quickly, but I would love to get to it at some point. So let's do the first line of the first story in this collection, which is called Mrs. Manstey's View. The view from Mrs. Manstey's window is, was not a striking one, but to her at least, it was full of interest and beauty. Mrs. Manstey occupied the back room on the third floor of a New York boarding house in a street where the ash barrels lingered late on the sidewalk and the gaps in the pavement would have staggered a Quintus Curtius. You never know what you're going to run into when you do these openings of the book. I've had to say daguerreotype, <laughs> Quintius Curtius. I hope I did it justice. Anyway, I'm really excited to get to this at some point. I don't have any plans to do it in the near future, but I, it's something that I will love having on my shelf and getting to whenever I'm ready. It's published by New York Review of Books, by the way. The next book is something of a win for this book haul because I've already read it. It's Our Colors by Gengoro Tagami, translated by Anne Ishii. I read this pretty much immediately after it came in. The second I saw that Gengora Tagame had released another graphic novel, I called Montana Book Company and ordered it because I am a huge fan of My Brother's Husband, Volume 1 and Volume 2. That is a really great book, two books. If you have not read it, I would absolutely recommend it. This is a coming-of-age story and a coming-out story. It follows a teenager in Japan who... The book describes him as someone who sees the world in synesthetic shades of blue and red, hence the sort of dynamic colors throughout uh, in the design of the book. But that doesn't really come through in the book. I mentioned that when I talked about it because, well, part of that is because the book is all black and white. It's a manga, obviously. All black and white. So you don't see these vivid reds and blues like you do on the cover. And Synesthesia is when you experience the world differently. So sometimes certain feelings or words will call up a color. But that's not really what we see. What we see is that when some, frequently when he's emotional, he'll just comment on colors. It doesn't feel like he's experiencing the world through those colors. It more feels like a nervous tick where he starts talking about different colors. Because he's talking about things that he sees. Like the sky is blue that person's genes are blue, things like that. So the synesthesia part doesn't really come through in the book. I wouldn't pick it up if that's what's intriguing you about it, but it is a really cute coming of age story and a story about a friendship. This is his friend. They have been friends since they were children and people sort of mistake them for boyfriend and girlfriend. And he meets this man who owns a cafe 
near where the, the high school is. This man is living as an out gay man and that sort of inspires him to come out. There's a really beautiful friendship and sort of mentorship that develops between them and the three of them form a really strong bond. I wasn't sure about the ending a little bit, but it's a very cute, very sweet story. I loved it. I would definitely recommend it. And since this is a manga, there isn't really a first line for me to read. So I'm just going to show you the first page. There you go. It was a good book. I would recommend it. It's Our Colors by Kengoro Tsugame and translated by Anne Ishii. The next book, My Policeman by Beth Ann Roberts. This is actually a supply chain problem in the U.S. because there's a different cover of it that has been released in the United States. And it's been back-ordered for a very long time. There's a movie of this coming out later this year with Harry Styles, and if that means anything to you. So of passing interest to me, but I don't really follow Harry Styles, so I'm not, like, gonzo about it. But anyway, there's a movie version coming out, and I've been intrigued by the book. And now that the movie's coming out, I really want to read it around the time the movie comes out. But the U.S. version has been backordered forever. So finally, it occurred to me, why don't you just check Blackwell's? I did, and it's available in the UK. So I ordered it from there. Here it is. I'm trying not to know a whole lot about this book because, one, the movie's coming. But two, I recently found out that it is inspired by the life of E.M. Forster. It follows a love triangle between an older artist... A young man who is a policeman, I believe that is the role that Harry Styles plays, and the policeman's wife. Interesting dynamic. Don't quite know how it relates in terms of historical accuracy to E.M. Forster, but th that's why I'm trying to go in a little bit blind. So that's the basic premise of this book. That's all I'm going to say about it. Really excited to read this. I can't remember when the movie is going to be released, but I believe it is September. There's a read-along of this going on in August on Instagram. But I decided not to participate because I have some other things lined up for August that I really want to get to and finish up. But I do want to do this before the movie comes out, so my time might be a little bit crunched. Let's do the opening of this book by Beth Ann Roberts. Oh, by the way, this edition is published by Vintage. It is the one from the UK, again. Peace Haven, October 1999. I considered starting with these words. I no longer want to kill you, because I really don't, but then decided you would think this far too melodramatic. You've always hated melodrama, and I don't want to upset you now, not in the state you're in, not at what may be the end of your life. That is the beginning of My Policeman by Beth Ann Roberts, soon to be a major motion picture. The next book is Another Country by James Baldwin. There were actually three books that I ordered from Montana Book Company, on a certain Saturday recently, one of them was Our Colors by Gengora Tagame, one of them was Another Country, and the other one is a cookbook for Joel. So even that one hasn't come in yet, but when it does, you won't see it in a book haul. I wanted to order them and pay up front because they were doing a promotion where a portion of their sales for that day would go to uh, women's rights and uh, abortion funds. So... That's why I did this. I was trying to think of books that I could buy immediately. Our Colors had just come out, so natural fit. I have wanted to read another James Baldwin book, and I asked earlier this year what people would recommend as a sort of next step for someone who has read Giovanni's Room, If Beale Street Could Talk, and Go Tell It on the Mountain. The overwhelming favorite, even with The Fire Next Time in the mix, was Another Country. So here it is. And I decided that was a good excuse to call in an order and get it here. This is a library builder. I don't have any plans to get to it anytime soon. That's kind of how I treat all of my James Baldwin books. I have them there. And when I am feeling ready to pick them up, I do. And there it is. This is a novel that is set in Greenwich Village and Harlem in New York City in the late 1950s. And it has a lot of themes that were taboo at the time the book was released, including, um, I must say, bisexuality, interracial relationships, and uh, extramarital affairs, things like that. Classic James Baldwin, looking at society and colorism and racism and all of that. Really excited to get to this. I've heard so many really good things about it from people who follow this channel. That got me very excited. Book one is called Easy Rider and has a quote from W.C. Handy. Chapter 1. 
He was facing 7th Avenue at Times Square. It was past midnight and he had been sitting in the movies in the top row of the balcony since 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Twice he had been awakened by the violent accents of the Italian film, once the usher had awakened him, and twice he had been awakened by caterpillar fingers between his thighs. He was so tired he had fallen so low that he scarcely had the energy to be angry. Nothing of his belonged to him anymore. He took the best, so why not take the rest? But he had growled in his sleep and bared the white teeth in his dark face and crossed his legs. That is the opening of Another Country by James Baldwin. Really looking forward to getting to this. James Baldwin is a tremendous writing talent. And that is one that was very highly recommended. If you follow along, you know that I was in Helena for Pride in Montana this past weekend. While I was there, I spent a lot of time at Montana Book Company. And I noticed... I've been seeing people getting the Heartstopper books back in stock lately. I noticed they had the first book, which I've already read and own, and volume two and volume four. They did not have volume three, but I decided to get these while they were there, so I will have them. And by the way, I forgot to mention that this is published by Vintage, another country. Uh, these are published by Graphics. So I decided to just grab them while they were there. I recently watched the first season of the TV show on Netflix, and it sparked my interest in reading the rest of the series again. I really liked the first volume. I didn't like the idea of being locked into reading them back to back to back. These are available online, and there was a bit of a price concern as well, although clearly I've spent a lot of money on books this month. So I decided I feel like it's going to be much more convenient and a lot easier for me to read these books in physical form, so I might as well try to get them. They'll be very quick reads. I may sit down with volume two this weekend and get through it, and then I'll just find volume three whenever it pops up, and I'll hold volume four until that point. And again, since these are graphic novels about a relationship between two British teenagers, really, really sweet cinnamon bun type books, I would recommend checking them out. Here is the opening spread in volume two. And here is the opening spread of volume four. So in the first book, they are friends. The one boy is gay and out in high school and is interested but thinks that the other guy is straight. He goes on a more of a journey to try to discover himself and define what his feelings for his friend are, they sort of begin dating at the end of the first volume. So this will pick up from there and go from there. The next book is something I had already read when I purchased a copy. It's The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Klune. I just wanted to have a copy for my shelves. So here it is. They had a copy at my local used bookstore. I picked it up when I was there and got the collected stories of Catherine Ann Porter and... I'm going to be glad to have it on my shelf because I feel like this is a book that I'm going to want to recommend to people. I might loan to people. Really cute book. If you're unfamiliar, it is about an orphanage for sort of magical children on an island. A man is sent there to make sure that they are being properly cared for. But what is meant by properly cared for is that they're being secured and kept away. And the rest of the world is being protected from them, like they're being contained. So he gets there, he meets these children, and kind of falls in love with them. And there's a queer angle as well. It's a really adorable book on so many levels. I talked about it a lot recently. I mentioned it in my favorite reads of the year so far. I'll put that video down below as well. It's really great. I would recommend it if you have not done it. And on the strength of that, I picked up a copy of Under the Whispering Door by T.J. Klune. This is, is I, I don't want to say his most recent book because he has a, a series as well, and I think one just came out for that. But uh, this is a recent book by him. I picked it up without knowing anything about what it was about, and I only got it on the strength of how much I loved the house in the, in the Cerulean Sea. Now that I have it, I find it's very heavily about death, <laughs> which does make me pause a little bit, given recent events in this household. We lost our dog, Guinness, in June. I don't think I'm ready for a book about death, even if it's affirming and positive and all of that. 
So this is probably gonna sit for a while. Maybe I'll get to it next year if I'm feeling ready for it, but I'm happy to have it here for when I am ready for it. Here's the description of it. A man called Oov meets the good place in Under the Whispering Door, a delightful queer love story from T.J. Klune, author of the New York Times and USA Today bestseller, The House in the Cerulean Sea. Welcome to Sharon's Crossing. The tea is hot, the scones are fresh, and the dead are just passing through. When a reaper comes to collect Wallace from his own funeral, Wallace begins to suspect he may be dead. And when Hugo, the owner of a peculiar tea shop, promises to help him cross over, but Wallace decides he's definitely dead. But even in death, he's not ready to abandon the life he barely lived. So when Wallace is given one week to cross over, he sets about living a lifetime in seven days. Hilarious, haunting, and kind, Under the Whispering Door is an uplifting story about a life spent at the office and a death spent building a home. I mean, it sounds great. And maybe this is a knee-jerk reaction given recent events again, but I feel like I'm going to need a little distance before I pick this up. Maybe that's wrong, but it, emotions aren't reasonable. So we'll leave it at that. I'm really looking forward to reading it at some point. It's going to be a while before I get to it. The only other thing I got is that while I was in the used bookstore and I got picked up uh, The House in the Cerulean Sea and The Collected Stories of Catherine Ann Porter, I took a chance to see if they would have a copy of The Voice at the Back Door by Elizabeth Spencer. This was mentioned in my book haul from, I believe, last month. I'll put a link to that down below as well so you can get more about that. I had found a copy of this book online that had a vintage cover and I bought it strictly because of the cover. It had that sort of lurid pulp novel, but it's not a pulp novel. Anyway, the cover is why I got it. And then it came and it's a little bit flimsy, so I feel like I'm not going to be able to read that copy of the book. So I took a chance and checked to see if my used bookstore would have this. They did. So now I have an edition of The Voice at the Back Door that I'm able to read. This was a book that was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize but did not win, and there was no winner given that year. And The New Yorker recently did an article about that situation and speculated that this did not win the Pulitzer Prize because it is a look at a racism that does not give white readers an out to feel good about themselves. And I'll say a lot more about it when I get around to reading it. I talked a lot more about it in my last... Friday Reads video, it occurs to me that I didn't do the first lines of these books. So uh, the reason I'm mentioning this is just that I got a copy that I'm going to be able to read, and it is something I brought into my library. I'm not going to include it for like official count purposes in book haul revisits, because I already have a copy of the book. I'm just mentioning it. So let's do the opening lines of these, because I lost my mind and forgot. Here's the opening of The House in the Cerulean Sea. One. Oh dear, Linus Baker said, wiping the sweat from his brow. This is most unusual. That was an understatement. He watched in rapt wonder as an 11-year-old girl named Daisy levitated blocks of wood high above her head. The blocks spun in slow, concentric circles. Daisy frowned in concentration. The tip of her tongue stuck out between her teeth. It went on for a good minute before the blocks slowly lowered to the floor. Her level of control was astounding. And this is published by Tor. Under the Whispering Door is also published by Tor. Let's do the opening. Patricia was crying. Wallace Price hated it when people cried. Little tears, big tears, full-on body-racking sobs. It didn't matter. Tears were pointless, and she was only delaying the inevitable. How did you know, she said, at her cheeks wet as she reached for the Kleenex box on his desk. She didn't see him grimacing. It was probably for the best. And just in case you want it, let's do the opening of... The Voice at the Back Door. Part 1, A Speeding Car. On a winter afternoon, unseasonably warm, a car was racing over country roads toward town. Dust gushing from the back wheels ran together behind in a dense swirl. On the headlands, the sun cast its thin glare above the sagebrush. It shot through the little trees, the pin oaks, and the new reedy pines, and its touch pained the eye. This edition is published by Avon. And there you have it. My book haul for the month of July. It's a lot, but I really think I did a good job picking books that fit my interests and what I'm going to read. And even if they end up sitting on my shelf for a while, they are books that I will want to get to at some point and will enjoy having in my library. If you have thoughts, feelings, recommendations based on this, let me know in the comment section down below if there are any that you think I should stay away from. It's a little late, but let me know in the comment section down below as well. As always, I really appreciate your time and I will be back until next time. Happy reading.